my name is Lexi. Book me for singing, songwriting, engineering, vocal production, and lessons through social media at LexiATL. Email at LexiSolo at gmail.com. Phone, text at 404-692-1299 or LexiATL.com. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. Yes, yes. I, if y'all don't know, I don't know who's been tuning in or not, but I recently, and when I say recently, I mean like two months ago, I got a library card at my local library and I've been checking out books by famous entertainers, people I look up to, or just people who I know of. And I like reading about their story. Now, this is not an autobiography. This is similar to the Beyonce book where someone took the time to comb through the history of the entertainer and piece together a timeline of their career, make certain assertions about their career, report on certain things that happen within the career, but it's not, it's not really a biased book. It's just reporting everything from all of the sources that um, have accumulated throughout this person's career. And Aliyah is one of my top three influences. If anybody ever asks me who are my influences, my top three is always Aliyah, Beyonce, and Alicia Keys. So I found this book at the library the other day. Before this one, I did a review on Toni Braxton's book. I believe it's called Unbreak My Heart. And now I have this one on Aliyah. This is Baby Girl, better known as Aliyah. Sorry for the lighting. Got the ring light. It's just light everywhere, all the glares. But yeah, super exciting because like I said, she's one of my biggest influences. And I learned so much about her from this book. And I feel a little embarrassed, honestly, because there were a few things I did not know about Aliyah and a few things that I chose not to dive into. Um, and when I say that, I'm specifically referring to her involvement with R. Kelly, which has been like a huge debate. It's been a huge thing over the past couple of years with the emergence of the documentary Surviving R. Kelly. And so this book just talks about a lot of different things. It's not on a drama tip. It's not, you know, for shock value. This is just what happened in Aliyah's lifetime in her career. So some general information about the book. This book was copywritten and published in 2021 by Catherine Iandoli. And like I said, I checked this out from my local library and this is a 263 page read. Just like the Tony Braxton book, this one is super easy to read, super, super easily finished. And the writing is done in a way that makes it easy to get through. And I don't, I'm not struggling to figure out crazy words and the chapters are written in a way that makes me feel like I'm getting through it very quickly. And yeah, it was just a really good read. So thank you so much to Kathy Ian Doley for putting this together. Um, let's get into the book review. I have my notes in front of me and yeah, let's get into some things. So some things that stuck out to me, the first thing I have in my notes is page 23. So let's go there and let's see. It says, Aliyah was soulful, but not intimidating. Pop, yet not too mainstream. R&B without being too niche. A flair for hip hop gave her an edge, which again set her apart from some of her peers, like the aforementioned Brandy, whose big hats and childish suspenders, as she sang Sasharine love songs, created a do no wrong air to her. That might work for a younger artist, but for a younger audience, but certainly not for the adults. Brandy, however, was also creating age appropriate music, which can inevitably narrow her lane. Aliyah could serve any listener and she did so very well. Like the born actor that she was, she knew just when to turn one side of herself on and the other side of herself off. It was felt in both the music and her interviews. 
And the reason why this stuck out to me is because I wanted to comment on the importance of not boxing yourself as an artist, being versatile, mysterious with your audience, and appealing to a wider audience. So just like you heard with this quote that I just read for you, Brandy is the example that they compare Aaliyah to because they were coming up around the same time and Aaliyah was actually a big inspiration for those artists, you know, um, as I'm sure they were inspirations for her as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what, what I like about what this is pointing out is that Aaliyah's sound is something that still competes to this very day, even though what they were doing was done in the late 90s, early 2000s, well, late 90s. Um, I listened to her song, which is finally on Spotify. It finally got on streaming platforms like two years ago. I was listening to um, We Need a Resolution and Try Again, and it fit so seamlessly into the playlist mix that Spotify had. And it really is a testament to how well Aliyah's music has stood the test of time. But the reason why it was able to stand the test of time is because the music was not too time stamped and it wasn't too, it wasn't written to be too innocent. There's a lot of references in this book where they say, and it's kind of weird, especially when they bring it up during the R. Kelly section, but they say that Aaliyah had a sexiness to her despite being such a young woman and being so innocent, there was also a sexiness to her, which also gave her an air of mystery. And she very much toted the line between sexy and innocent, you know what I mean? So that, that mystery played in her favor and the way that the music was written, there was always a kind of mystery around her age even with the controversy between her and R. Kelly, they never wanted her age to be a big factor in anything she was doing, which is very interesting. Um, to me, these days, there is no teen or preteen market. So somebody like a Brandy or, or I think Monica, Monica had a time where she stayed very much age appropriate, right? And other R&B girls, but we don't really have that these days. But I think what's great about Aliyah's situation is she was a little more grown without being raunchy and without doing things in a tasteless way. Unfortunately, there's not really a preteen or teen market in the music right now. Everything seems like it's just raunchy and ratchet and super grown, super explicit. And so when I hear this description of Aaliyah as being mysterious and not too intimidating and soulful, something that you could feel in her music and her interviews and hearing her image and her sound described in that timeless way, is something that I for sure try to aspire towards with my own music. Something that's not going to box me, something that is relatable across age brackets. So let's move on to the next thing that stuck out to me page 34 it says at face value the relationship between r kelly and aliyah was just another case of history repeating itself when two artists work together extensively to create art feelings sometimes seep into the work the creative and romantic pairing seems almost idyllic where in one breath you exchange meaningful glances and the next you're sharing a love for whatever it is you create, be it songs, painting, whatever. Take John Lennon and Yoko Ono or even Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, Lauren Hill and Wyclef Jean. The story is retold in so many different versions, all with a similar theme. They came for the art and stayed for each other. Likewise, the dynamic between a grown male pop star and his teenage core fan base is always tricky. In the 1990s, we saw it happen time and time again, where an artist like Kevin Richardson of the Backstreet Boys was 27 during the group's prime, singing love songs to 13-year-olds. It creates this veil of illusion where both the artist and the fan are ageless through the music. 
That's the relationship the music industry creates for album sales and global popularity. This part was interesting to me because it said right here, it creates this veil of illusion where both the artist and the fan are ageless through music. And y'all heard R. Kelly's name come up in this. Um, how can I book you for a photo? Oh wait, you look beautiful, Lex. Thank you, thank you, Leah. How can I book you for a photo shoot? Um, you can either DM me, but the best way would be to go through my website, LexiATL.com and go to shop and work with Lexi. That would be the best way. At least that's the way I would prefer. Otherwise, my contact information is on my page. So yeah, let me know there. But anyway, this whole concept of the fan and the artist being ageless through music, right? Through this veil of music, everyone is in like an ageless situation. So it's interesting that they brought this up during the R. Kelly section because it's describing like what happened between R. Kelly and Aaliyah. So what happened with R. Kelly and Aaliyah, right? Basically, they had a relationship. A lot of people would say that she was groomed by R. Kelly. And I actually did not watch Surviving R. Kelly because I've read this book. I might actually go back and watch it now it's just not something that i wanted to get into because of alia and because of how i don't know if they mentioned her or not but she was caught up in this whole conspiracy this whole thing against r kelly and a lot of people did not want to see her image get ruined and i was actually there and witnessing some things some things said behind the scenes by the family that you know they were willing to do some stuff to get to lie on people to get it, it was a whole thing but anyway i'm not gonna say too much i'm not gonna say too much on that but it's very interesting and the book is right it does happen all the time where in music especially we are working closely for hours on end and you have to get to know each other to write good music you have to get to know each other in order for the music to be believable and for it to have feeling when someone is writing a song for an artist. You just, you have to get personal. Otherwise the music is not gonna have any soul, it's not gonna have any feeling, it's not gonna have any connection. But what happens is we're spending all of these long hours in the studio together, getting to know one another. In my situation, I'm an engineer, so if I happen to have a male client who is attractive, we are getting closer. And there have been times when the when boundaries and lines have been crossed in that client artist relationship, you know, that client engineer situation. There have been times when the line has been crossed. It's inevitable. You know, we are both connected through the art and the love of what we're doing and we're spending this long time together and we begin to have feelings for each other when the thing that got us together was the music and a lot can happen when that connection is made so when it came to the whole r kelly thing probably the most disheartening thing to read about for me we thought that her style was so cool right and so it was hip-hop it was street, but sweet. That's what she would say. And that's one of the quotes that's in the book. It was street, but sweet. But then to hear how, when she was involved with R. Kelly, he didn't want his women to be looked at or acknowledged by other people. He didn't really want anyone speaking up for his women. So something that they mentioned was the street, but sweet aesthetic, right? That was actually him wanting Aaliyah to take on his persona in a female form and the baggy clothes and the hats and even hiding the eyes, right? It was said that he didn't like his women to look at other men or to garner the attention of men outside of himself. And so when you think about it from that aspect, the baggy clothes and the shades so nobody could look her in her eyes, um, it's, we love that style, but it might not have come from a good place. It might not have come from an innocent place. You know, it might have come from 
is the word nefarious. Can I say that? It might have come from a nefarious place. It was a means of control over Aliyah, but to the world, it was this cool, sexy, mysterious, street but sweet style. So reading that in the book was kind of disheartening and it, it makes you realize that you really don't know what people are going through and you really sometimes, and this is really annoying as an artist, sometimes the most painful situations, the most painful memories create the best art or give us the best reactions. That's one thing that as an artist, I don't love. <laughs> um, I came to a realization maybe a few months ago, actually, so very recently, that I don't wanna subject myself to pain or I don't wanna expect to have to go through pain to make good art. But for whatever reason, the best art comes from the most terrible situations, the most painful situations. And so as I was reading this book, her imagery, which was heavily influenced, actually like handpicked by R. Kelly, that was the influence. That was the painful part. And there's all these allegations, like she became pregnant, they got married, but then, you know, the, the lying about her age to make it legitimate, but she was really, she wasn't 18, she was like 15, and all of these things surrounding it. And I got a front row seat to the family at one point in my, a couple years ago. I don't work with the family anymore, but it was just interesting to read that and then understand the reactions of some family members. They're very pissed about the whole situation. You know, it's like, did the family know what was happening? There's even mentions of her mom, which I'm so, I was surprised by. There's even mentions of her mom having potentially gotten involved with R. Kelly, romantically, sexually, whatever. Um, and it does mention these things, you know? She was, Aliyah was in the studio long hours with this man who is older than her, writing inappropriate, age inappropriate things for her and having such influence over her. And a lot of people might wonder, well, why wasn't she protected? After reading this, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. There's even, oh my God, there's even the allegation in this that on a tour bus, she and R. Kelly were caught in the act, you know? So there's a lot of evidence like people knew what was going on between her and R. Kelly and Nobody stepped in because that's unfortunately, that's part of the process. That's what happens when you spend long hours, but also someone who has skin in the game, like her uncle, there's no way they didn't know that that was a possibility. And so when people, when people get upset and ask the question, well, why wasn't she protected? It's it's a legitimate ask, I think. It's a legitimate ask. Because knowing what you know about the industry and having skin in the game for so long, you know what goes on when you spend long hours with people. I think even Toni Braxton mentions it in her book. And while it is possible that people grow close and nothing romantic or sexual happens, it's highly unlikely that things did not happen, you know? So, yeah. Let's move on from there because um, I spent way too much time on that. That's probably the most I will mention about any controversy from the book. And the book does a great job of not making the entire thing about her relationship with R. Kelly and really giving a timeline of her career. But that is something that needs to be looked at in the grand scheme of her history. That is a big part of Aliyah's history of what we know about her. But to move on to the next part, something else that stuck out to me is on page 87. An important part of Aliyah's next gen transformation was shifting her style. So this is after she stopped working with R. Kelly and they were trying to figure out what is her image gonna be? How is her music gonna sound? How are we going to transition? Again, it could not be drastic. So many stars attempts at reinvention 
often look exactly like that, reinventing an existing performer and turning them into someone else completely. Typically, it happens with musicians when they're about to change their sound, so their hair, makeup, and dress will follow suit. <clears throat> um, that approach arguably lacks authenticity and feels more like a phase. With Aliyah, there was staying power, but also a need to create something strikingly striking visually, which had fans clamoring to look like her. Let me see. But I want to go back to that part. It says that approach of reinventing lacks authenticity and feels more like a phase. This is something that I try to get my clients to understand. It is the idea of evolution. There's always, and even for myself, I try to keep the idea of evolution in mind. And what I mean by evolution is you start from project one, right? What does that imagery look like when you first start with project one? When you do project two, are you doing a complete 180 and completely shifting your gears? Does it make sense for you to do that? Why don't you want to do more of a natural evolution, a natural change, like a, a coming of age of your career, if you will. So many artists want to be shocking and do shocking things. And so the image that they start with when they find themselves trying to be grown, right? I think I don't, I didn't think of any great examples before I came on to here, but I think one clear cut example might be Miley Cyrus going from that childhood Disney star to this grown woman, Miley Cyrus, who is now an adult. We saw her go from Hannah Montana to what does she do? She got in with ear drummers and she had the crazy hair. She was sticking her tongue out all the time. She was twerking all the time. She was hanging out with Mike Will all the time. And there just felt like a period of time in her career where she was trying very hard to be broken away from that child star image, that Disney image, right? But the way that it was done, it made it feel inauthentic and it made it feel as though she was purposely trying to change her image. And that's what this part of the book is commenting on. The approach arguably lacks authenticity and feels more like a phase. And that's what everybody, I think even Miley Cyrus would call it a phase as well. When she was hanging out with ear drummers and doing these hip hop inspired songs. And I, I guess they did an album together. I don't think I listened to the project, but I actually liked the music that Miley Cyrus was doing during that time. But then that lasted for like less than a year, right? And then suddenly she did what she did with the hip hop community. And then she went back to her country roots and people were like, Wow, remember that crazy phase from Molly Cyrus? And then I think she was just doing things like twerking, having black dancers dance with big teddy bears and um, being naked all the time and just being lewd, you know? It was weird, it was weird. Although I felt like Molly Cyrus was a lot of fun during that time, which I hope is not offensive because I don't know where she was mentally during that time in her life. But to me, it just felt like she was having a great time. Other people would disagree because of how she started in the industry. But that would be an example of a hard shift in imagery that people did not take kindly to. And pretty much everybody recognizes that, oh, she was going through a phase when she did this, when she was in this point of her life. Another example that's coming to mind some people would call it a subtle shift, but for me, it was a very much complete 180 shift. And when I think about Rihanna, right? Because I knew Rihanna from uh, Music in the Sun, I think was the name of her first album. And then the second album was A Girl Like Me. And then I kind of fell off with her music. I think Umbrella started coming out and Unfaithful was on the A Girl Like Me out, but Umbrella came out and then the whole thing with Chris Brown happened and her image completely, it went from good girl, it went good girl gone bad, right? That's what her image did. 
And even though it wasn't a phase because she leaned into that edginess more after that situation, for me, that was a hard transformation because I wasn't used to seeing Rihanna in that light. Now, I'm probably a little biased on that because I did not like that that situation was used to also bring in a more edgy and darker imagery of Rihanna. But a lot of people would say that that was a pretty good transformation. I'm just a little blinded by it because I did not, I didn't get into the good girl gone bad era. I didn't come back on as a fan of Rihanna until Rude Boy came along and she started putting like, you know, the Caribbean swag back into her music because that's why I loved her in the first place. I felt she was getting a little too pop for me in a lot of ways. I still liked her music, but I wasn't an active fan the way I used to be. But Rihanna for me would be another example. I think most other people would agree that that was a pretty good transformation. But for me, using the whole Chris Brown situation to go into the edgier imagery felt weird for me as a fan. But that would be an example of, you know, the transformation thing happening. So it is something that all of us as artists should keep in mind is to be mindful of our evolution. Is it necessary to do a hard 180 change? If we are doing a hard 180 change, what purpose is it serving? I think if the intention was for Rihanna to get into a more grown, a more edgy, a more sexier image, then riding the coattails of that situation with Chris Brown was the best possible spin they could do. This thing happens, everyone is seeing her as like a victim, but then they take that situation and they rebrand it and they call it good girl gone bad. And it's kind of genius. I didn't like it at the time, but it is it is a genius thing that they did. Um, that served a purpose and it made sense. As artists, we just have to be mindful. Is this transformation necessary? Does it make sense? And what is the imagery coming out of this? What does the imagery look like coming out of this? So I think we should just keep that in mind. I'm trying to see... Page 147 is another part that stuck out to me. So with these book reviews, I'm always looking for lessons for myself, but also lessons that I can share with other artists. I'm gonna restart my camera really quickly. That wasn't as quickly as I wanted it to be. <laughs> but um, I, I always wanna share lessons with other artists because it's lessons for myself and lessons for y'all. My service is to the creative. I am a creative myself my service is to other creatives. And so that's why I'm going through and telling you all the things that stuck out to me. But I would highly encourage you to read this book for yourself as well. Uh, the next thing that stuck out is on page 147. It was the money. Let me see. Okay. It was money. It was egos. It was fame. It was also black round and Aliyah was caught in the crosshairs of that war as both an artist, part owner and family member. But even through the storm, they worked together for one more go around and made some hits. Uh, the reason why this stuck out to me is because there are a lot of things that affect someone's career outside of the actual music. So this says it was money, it was ego, it was fame. Now this part of the book is commenting on the fact that I don't know exactly what happened. I think there might've been some bad business going on with Black Round. There was definitely jumping ship, um, probably breakdowns in communication, but a lot of times, this is, this is commenting on the relationship between Aliyah and Timbaland. They hadn't worked together something happened. I don't even remember. They don't really get into, well, they do, but I don't remember because I was supposed to do this review weeks ago, two weeks ago. So maybe I would remember if I would have did it as soon as I finished the book. But they had gotten into an argument. They were slowly drifting apart as Aaliyah was looking for a new sound. It wasn't to cut out the team of Timbaland and Missy. It wasn't to cut them out, but because of how other things affected the working relationship, that also affected the 
music and affected the personal relationship. So this part stuck out to me because it was money, it was egos, it was fame, and Aaliyah was caught in the crosshairs of that war as an artist, part owner, and family member. So you have loyalties to family, but also loyalties to the people who helped to create a sound for you that made you such an undeniable artist, right? They're a piece of the package. And it's a cautionary tale for us artists who are not yet on that level, but we're in the industry, right? A lot of things, this industry is so like happenstance, you know? There's a lot of things that we don't necessarily control and it can be something small. I know even for myself, I was working with an artist a couple years ago and she's nice. She's, she's a nice person and she works hard. But because her label did not handle me properly, they did not handle paying me properly, any friendship that I might have thought about trying to pursue with this artist or any future working relationships I might have thought about pursuing with this, with this artist, suddenly that was no longer an issue of concern for me. And suddenly I didn't want to, I didn't care to be considered in future business dealings with them because of how the label treated me when it came to the payment, because of how some of the other people in the, in the situation did not look out for me to make sure I got my credits. And a lot of things that I did, people were not recognizing my value um, in the involvement, in my involvement in the project. So, but the core of it was, I was not being paid for my time. And although the artist may not have known that something was wrong with the payment of the people involved in the production, she's probably running around thinking everybody's cool, but we're fighting with her label to get payment. So now that messes up the relationship that the other creators had with this particular artist, right? So as an artist, we always have to be mindful that this is a very fickle business and this business includes juggling people's egos, juggling people's hierarchy, because another part of it is I'm lower on the totem pole compared to other people who are in the situation. So of course I'm feeling less valued because I'm down here and these people are up here. When it when you compare what they've done mainstream and what I've done mainstream and what industry successes people have had. So even though I have the expertise because of the time that I've put into this industry, I'm still down here because I haven't gotten major placements like other people who are up here, right? So all of those things play a role. We have to understand our hierarchy when it comes to working with these people. And then we have to understand that relationships outside of what we have with somebody could affect the working relationship that we have with someone, right? So like the case with this artist, my relationship with her was tainted because the label was not properly paying me or giving me credit on the project. So then it becomes weird to still wanna come around you and call you sis and call you family when I'm being done dirty by your label. And now you don't understand why I'm upset with you or why I'm not hanging out with you or why I don't show up to the club appearances or why I feel uninvited or I don't want to come around. It's because that relationship has been tarnished and tainted. So. Something that we as artists need to be mindful of is how fickle people can be. You're not gonna be able to control each relationship and each connection that people have, obviously, but the best that you can do is treat people fairly, treat people right, be good to people. And then as an artist, we gotta know a lot of people. Something that I struggle with and something that I need to do a better job of is keeping in contact with people and reaching out to people just to check on them and say, hey, I think in general, if I did that, if we all did a better job of just checking in with each other, then we could avoid a lot of the BS situations that go on in the industry and try not to let the politics affect the work and affect friendships and potential friendships. So that's why that part stuck out to me. Next page, 156, what does this one say? Aliyah's dream the month before she passed away. Ooh, this one hurt my heart so much. And this one had me 
depressed for at least a week after finishing the book. And I even started to go into a deep dive um, in trying to get more answers with the plane crash. The plane crash is something that I never really, like I always knew that she died in a plane crash, but until I read this book, for some reason, I just never cared to look into the details of this plane crash. And the reason why I'm pointing out Aliyah's dream the month before she passed away is because she kind of knew that something was coming for her because she was having these dreams. She said it in some interview. Um, and let me just read it for you. For 40 minutes on the sofa, and this is kind of a long excerpt, so y'all stay with me. For 40 minutes on a sofa, Les Chow, I hope I'm saying that name properly, um, sat and heard what many would continue to dissect for decades to come. Aliyah was reserved at first, but once she let the words out, they just kept flowing. She settled right back into the dream she was repeatedly having, along with all of its ebbs and flows. In the dream, it's dark. Aliyah is being chased and she's scared, but then all of a sudden she takes flight. She describes it as swimming in the air. She feels free and weightless. Nobody can reach me. Nobody can touch me, she continues. Then she starts to talk out of concern for the dream. What does it even mean? Anxiety kicks in as she thinks it means she's becoming jaded and wants to fly away from her career, so to speak. She started to explain to the reporter how she doesn't feel that way, almost trying to convince them both that this wasn't the case. She goes on about her childhood, how the idea that she never got to be a kid was a total fallacy. She felt like a normal little girl with some minor, red major modifications. She went, in to, she went on to discuss with the reporter her earliest beginnings on stage with Gladys Knight, preparing for what she felt was her destiny to be famous. I worked towards this dream, hard, very hard. I took singing lessons. I took part in school performances, she admits. I did everything I could to become a good entertainer because a pretty appearance doesn't make you a star. Mmm, why didn't I tap into that before? Let me, ooh, a good appearance does not make you a star. But fear is one hell of a poison and coupled with being shy, it can be a prison. I preferred to take refuge in my dreams, she continued. That dreaminess about her followed her from childhood to adulthood. As she also admitted, she kind of stares off into space when she's around family and friends, thinking of something else beyond what is within her reach. Where am I? She hypothetically asked the reporter. No idea. Probably in higher spheres. Sometimes she doesn't even know herself, basically joining us all in the enigma that is Aliyah. Back to the dream of flying. Aliyah is in Egypt, she walks the same sand-dusted ground that Cleopatra and the pharaohs once walked. Egypt was one of her travel goals she wanted to visit there ever since she was a child, often burying her head in books about Egypt. And it goes on and on and on. But So that's the dream, right? She's flying. Something is scaring her, but it's dark. She's being chased. Then all of a sudden she takes flight. And then... We got to move into, I'm going to remember this quote though, being a pretty appearance doesn't make you a star. Let's move on to page 169, where we start to get into the details surrounding her death and the plane crash, right? So we heard that dream. She's scared. It's dark. And then suddenly she takes flight. 169, the aircraft that attempted to fly Aliyah home, a Cessna 402B twin engine plane, can carry anywhere from six to 10 passengers, factoring in cargo and the weight distribution of the people on board. The aircraft is only able to take off at a weight of 6,300 pounds. An empty Cessna 402B itself weighs 4,117 pounds alone, with the fuel weighing it at 804 pounds. Considering a significant number of the team flew on board, Aliyah, seven of her team members, and one pilot, with their luggage and equipment in tow, they were pushing the limits of the bodies allowed on board, even without factoring in their luggage and heavy equipment. The Abaconia also reported that there was no indication that any of the luggage was weighed before it was loaded on the plane. The baggage that managed to be salvaged weighed 574 pounds. That's not including one piece of luggage that was lost in the marsh. The remaining weight allowed was around 805 pounds. 
Aaliyah's bodyguard, Scott Gallen, was 300 pounds himself. That left a little over 500 pounds remaining among seven individuals, meaning around 70 pounds per person was the maximum weight. Survival was impossible given those numbers. Investigators have surmised that the plane was carrying a weight that was 700 pounds beyond its authorized capability. It was arguably the perfect evening for flying with nothing but clear skies as the plane was scheduled to head from the Marsh Harbor Airport to Miami's executive airport in Opalaka. The engine prior to takeoff, the engines were inspected and appeared to be working fine. Everything was a go. The plane traveled down the runway and hit the air at 6.45 p.m., though not for long. Within a minute's time, the airplane reached a height of about 200 feet off the ground Spectators have said that the plane made it to the air and quickly took a left turn for the worse, nose diving and crashing beneath bushes, facing 180 degrees from its direction of takeoff. Gasoline was spilled everywhere, igniting a fire all around the remnants of the airplane. One of the engines, the right one, appeared to be in flames while the plane was still in the air. Kingsley and his cousin didn't see the crash, but they heard it as they were sitting and eating in the airport. He saw people running with fire extinguishers to head to the site, and that's when he learned of the crash. He was told to never speak of the incident. The plane was left in torn up parts, some pieces still ablaze, others completely disintegrated, charred seats were ejected from the plane, and bodies were flung everywhere, while some were still stuck inside. The pilot was found dead in the cockpit, Aliyah's bodyguard, Scott Gallen, was found alive, saying he was thirsty and asking about Aliyah's well-being. He was her bodyguard since high school. He was also saying that he wanted to see his son. Gallen died around 10 minutes into his flight to a Nassau, uh, Nassau hospital. One of the other passengers, hairstylist Anthony Dodd, was still alive yet badly burned and was successfully transported to a hospital in the Bahamas. Nassau's Princess Margaret Hospital, but he passed away after three on Sunday morning. Another unidentified passenger was found alive and severely burned, screaming in agony. That person barely survived being transported before passing away shortly thereafter. And almost 20 feet away from the wreck lay Aliyah. She was still in her seat with her seatbelt on, coiled up on her left side. She looked as though she was hugging herself, her head affixed between her legs. Her hair was burned off from the flames and she was covered in burns with signs of massive head trauma. Aliyah had a weak heart, so while the autopsy report confirmed that condition, there was also speculation that she suffered a heart attack during the short flight. Her body was so severely burned and in such a state of shock that her survival would have been unthinkable. An icon was gone at just 22 years old due to the crash of a plane that should have never taken flight. Hmm. So I was, let's see, this was in 2001. I was born in 93, so I would have been eight years old when this crash happened. And... I did not realize who Aliyah was until after she died. So when I heard that she died in a plane crash, because I'm, you know, when I'm, I was younger, I used to think like, man, it would be so cool to see Aliyah in concert. And I think um, probably as the internet started becoming more prominent, I would search and find out more and then realize that, oh my gosh, she passed away and she died in a plane crash, which kind of fuels my fears of flying a little bit. I will get on the plane, but because I knew that Aliyah died in a plane crash, getting on the plane is actually very scary for me. And I kind of think of it as like, you know, if this is how I go, this is how I go. That might be really bad to think about it that way, but that's how I think about it. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know where I was. I was in elementary school because they, they also said a couple weeks later, the World Trade Center had two planes crash into it. Um, and I know I was in elementary school at the time. 
But again, even that event, I didn't understand the magnitude back then. So I can't tell you exactly where I was when I found out that Aliyah passed away. But when I realized that she was gone, I cried. And um, I don't think my family even really cared how deeply I really loved Aliyah. I probably hid it from them, honestly, just not feeling... There's a lot of things I realized I just didn't feel safe sharing with my family. That's kind of sad. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think my family even knew how much I loved Aliyah. If I asked them, I don't know who would... I don't know if anybody would realize it. I don't know. But um, yeah, I did not know the details of the crash until reading this book like two weeks ago. So I went into a little bit of a rabbit hole for a few hours looking at any looking at any video I could find explaining the plane crash, seeing visuals and animations for how the plane would have gone down, seeing pictures and video of the wreckage. Of of course they did not have Aliyah on there. Like you couldn't see her her body or the conditions of the the bodies of the other people involved in the crash. But um I got sad all over again and pissed off because before she got on the plane, she didn't want to get on that plane. Okay, so there there are a few things that happened with this flight that was like we should not have lost Aliyah this day. She was trying to rush to get back to Miami. She was dating Dame Dash at the time. They say that she was in a rush to get back to Miami or whatever to see him so she could get back to the mainland to see him. Um, but they already had a plane, a bigger plane, something that they were used to traveling on. They already had a plane chartered for the next day. But for some reason, they were trying to leave early and get back a day early when they did not have to. It was already planned for them to take a bigger plane. So that's one. Two, she did not want to get on this plane. She saw the plane that they were supposed to get on and she said no. And they got into an argument with, allegedly they got into an argument with the pilot and argued for two hours. They were supposed to leave two hours earlier. So 645, they were two hours behind when it was said that they were supposed to leave. Um, but Aliyah did not want to get on that plane. And she was arguing and she was fighting, but she was not going to get on. She did not want to get on the plane. Other factor, somebody gave her a pill and a taxi driver who brought, who brought them to the airport says that she was asleep and they had to carry her onto the plane. Otherwise she would not have gotten on because she didn't want to get on. She did not want to get on that plane, but apparently she was given a pill. She was drugged. She was put to sleep. So you think about that and you compare the dream that she was saying, she's scared, something's chasing her. And then it goes dark and suddenly she's flying. So she's up in the air on this plane that she did not want to be on. And she's unconscious, not knowing what's happening because somebody put her on a plane against her consent. In my mind, I'm thinking, you know, maybe, maybe they weren't trying to argue. Maybe they were tired of arguing. And I've heard stories of artists being drugged so that they will comply. I wouldn't put this past whoever was on the team that day to make sure she got on the plane, giving her the pill, even though they could have just waited till the next day. Worst case scenario, go get a hotel and spend the night and, and we would still have Aliyah today, right? Um, but that didn't happen. So somebody went against her consent and put her to sleep to like, like who ordered that they have to, I have to reread this part because I, I don't remember. And it's probably hazy, those directly involved, it's probably hazy as to why they wanted to leave the day early when it would it would have been the perfect ending to the trip, you know? And then the other part of that is apparently the pilot was not even certified or cleared to fly the plane that day. Apparently he was under the influence of liquor and cocaine but he was not even like he had just gotten out of jail or something. 
he was not even supposed to be the pilot. But because of some negligence on the part of whatever air airport they decided to go through, this guy was behind the cockpit flying the plane. So Aliyah didn't want to go. They didn't have to go because the next day there was already a plane chartered for them. She didn't want to go. She was drugged and the pilot was not even supposed to be flying the plane. Had he been certified, this reminds me of a movie that I saw with Tom Cruise where he's, I don't remember what it was called, maybe American something. Can I find it real quick? Tom Cruise movie, American Made? That doesn't seem right. Nope, that's it. American Made. Okay. In the movie Tom Cruise plays in, the movie is called American Made. In the movie, he is a pilot and he is trafficking drugs for Mexican cartel into the United States. There's a scene where he's trying to explain to like one of the fat Mexican guys like, cause they were trying to get him on a plane with a bunch of pounds of cocaine, but they also wanted to send like this fat Mexican dude with him to make sure that he didn't like steal the drugs or whatever. And he got into an argument with the guy, with the people on the ground, like, hey, if this guy gets on my plane, if his fat ass gets on this plane with me, we're not gonna make it over the brush. The reason why your other pilots can't make it, the reason why they crashed and died is because y'all don't understand weight distribution and weight limits of these planes. If you let him, if you make him get on here, either, either he doesn't come with me or I don't fly as many pounds of drugs as y'all want me to. And I think they end up, the guy stays behind, the fat Mexican stays behind and Tom Cruise gets on with all these drugs and he makes it past the clearing. Oh, and the other thing was the runway that they had for him to take off. It wasn't a long enough runway. So that was the other part. He needed enough time for the engines to get up to speed, but the weight also has to had to be distributed properly. But I think about that and I wonder in this situation with Aliyah, had the pilot been certified, had he not been negligent, had he been certified, right? There's no way a proper pilot would have let anyone get on that plane. There's no way a proper pilot would have let that many people with that much luggage get on that tiny plane. I Googled what this plane looked like. I would not wanna fly with what I know camera and sound equipment looks like when it comes to these big video shoots. Equipment and luggage, along with eight, nine people on this little teeny plane. It's a Cessna 402B twin engine plane. It's a small plane. If he was a proper pilot, there's no way he would have said yes to taking off. I don't care how much we're arguing. Pilots have a duty to get people to and from safely, to include themselves. No pilot would take that on knowing that there's a possibility they're gonna crash because with the possibility of crashing is the possibility of dying and no proper pilot would have let that happen. So it's just really sad when I think about all the factors that went into her death that I did not realize until reading this book. And it made me sad for a little bit, but um, yeah, other than that, um, let's see. I'm gonna keep this one quote cause I do wanna end on some quotables. But from page 156, a pretty appearance doesn't make you a star. Ooh, I feel that. Some people think you just gotta look the part, but no. Oh, oh, so the perfect quotable to end off with this video, right? It's on page 223. So let's see here. Um, it was one of her last interviews. Aliyah said something that resonates with me during hard times in my life. She had just released her self-titled album on July 7, 2001 and flew to Paris, France for promo work. But Alia said, referring to her career as a singer, rejection is painful, but I felt deep in my heart and in my soul that I had it and that I would do it and that I could do it. And I honestly believed that no matter what anybody said, 
And I honestly believed that no matter what anybody said. And I continued and I said, fine, you don't want me, somebody else will. And I will prove it. I will get out there and I will be a star. And I really meant it. And you have to have that frame of mind. You have to have that kind of confidence to make it in this industry or you won't make it. So I did it. And I'm very proud of the fact that I did it. So that is the book, Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. Highly, highly, highly encourage you all to read it. It's a great read. And in general, I would encourage you to pick up a book about anybody famous and just read about their life, read about their experiences, because it can help you to know what to stay privy to in pursuit of this artistry and to understand some of the struggles that you might go through and how you might want to handle it moving forward. Um, so I read the Tony Braxton book, Unbreak My Heart. Now I've read Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. And um, yeah, I'm currently reading one that's called Growing Up Shared. Do I have it here? Yes. I'm currently reading one called Growing Up Shared, which is about oversharing on social media. It's really a book for like parents, but even if you're not a parent, you don't have kids, you can learn from it. Um, so that's my next read, but highly encourage you all to get a book, read, go to your local, your local library. There's a lot of free resources that we can use as artists and yeah, read these stories and make decisions about your own careers based on the experiences of some of the greats. I had to restart my camera really quickly, but, um, yeah, I hope that you all have enjoyed this book review. I know this was a very long book review. <laughs> um, and this is just going to go ahead and serve as the Lex chat for the upcoming week. And I'll make the Tony Braxton book review a part of a Lex chat as well. Cause it's only right. You got to give respect to Tony, but I think it's interesting that I read this book and in the Tony Braxton book, they also mentioned Black Round and how Barry kind of like screwed her out of her deal with Arista. I just think that was an interesting um, link between these two books. Completely unintended. I did not know that Tony Braxton was managed by Barry Hankerson and eventually signed to Black Round. I did not know that. And then I read this book with Aaliyah and of course that's her uncle and he's the owner. CEO of Black Round, but yeah, highly encourage y'all to go out there, get a library card, read, take a break from the screens and being inside all day. Just go lay in the sun somewhere, or just lay on, in the park on the grass, read a book. Or the way that I got through these books is I started having cardio days. So twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do cardio at the gym and I go on the elliptical or the treadmill and I go through these books and I get a solid hour of reading. And I don't know why, but it just works so well for me. My body, I'm kind of taking attention off of whatever my body is doing because I'm occupying my mind with what's in the pages of the book. And I'm able to get through my workout and get a good cardio session in, but I'm also able to learn about some of the greats in the music industry. As an artist, I think it's important to study these people because we need to have a sense of music history. So I implore everybody, please go out, get a library card or get into buying books or get into audio books. They're just so amazing. The, the places that it takes your mind and the things that you can learn from these people. So at the risk of rambling on, I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. Thank you so much for listening. If you're on YouTube, thank you so much for watching, but yeah, let me know what you think about this book review in the comments or the review section. Let me know what you think about everything I talked about. Let me know if you're going to go buy the book or if you're going to go read the book or if you're going to go get a library card. I would congratulate you on that if you make that decision. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my name is Lexi. This is also going to go up on the Lexi quotes page. But um, yeah, if you are listening on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, listening on any other podcasting platform, please like, subscribe, share, leave comments, leave reviews. All of those things help me. 
And you can find me, Lexi, everywhere at Lexi ATL. That's at L-E-X-C-A-T-L. Find me on Instagram to join these chats live at Lexi ATL. Um, check out my website for my music, my album. If you want to work with me, if you want to get merchandise, that's Lexi ATL. L-E-X-C-A-T-L is where you can find me on basically any platform. Okay. But thank y'all so much for joining me in this book review for Aaliyah, baby girl, better known as Aaliyah. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Lexi. Until next time. Peace. Leave it up to me. Can satisfy you. Leave it up to me. I can satisfy you. Mm-hmm.